my name is Daniel Dorr. I teach at the Department of Communication at Tel Aviv University. Uh, I'm a linguist and a media researcher. Language evolution is a topic that uh, has become very, very popular in scientific discourse in the last uh, 30 years. Um, and it has many very different interpretations. Uh, my view of it is the following. Uh, language as such is a socially constructed tool of communication, what I call a technology of communication. It is socially constructed, but at the very same time, we as human individuals seem to have cognitions and also emotions that are specifically suited in many different ways for the usage of this technology. So the question is, how did language as a social technology evolve and how did we as humans evolve in order to be good users and good acquirers of this technology? And the general picture that I've developed uh, together with Eva Yablonka, um, a very important um, evolutionary biologist, <coughs> is first uh, based on uh, a certain very specific view of language as a communication technology, um, which is uh, uh, structured, constructed through social negotiation for a very specific function that is the instruction of imagination. And language uh, came into being. It was invented and developed by communities of very early um, uh, hominids uh, when the social conditions were set for that. However, from uh, a certain point uh, onwards, when language became such a successful element of human life and actually revolutionized everything about human life, uh, human individuals became to be selected for their capacity to play around with this technology and use it and be good communicators of that particular type. And because of that, we went through a long process of genetic accommodation uh, for language. Uh, and the uh, end result is that we now have the languages that we have and the capacity that we have to acquire them and use them. In the second half of the 20th century, um, from uh, the beginning of Chomsky's work onward, the, the, the major question about language in linguistics was the question of ontogeny. That is, how do children acquire language? That, that was the question. And from there, the question of evolution was simply, um, was simply um, um, following. Uh, the idea was children had certain innate capacities that allowed them to acquire language, and the question was, okay, if that's the case, which evolutionary processes did we have to go through in order for children to have these, capacity, these capacities. Um, I think that once you uh, uh, start looking at language uh, as a socially constructed technology of communication, um, then the question of phylogeny, the question of what happened in the evolution of uh, humankind that allowed for that to happen, is both becoming more important and is becoming also more independent of the uh, question of ontogeny. It's not that the question of language acquisition is no longer important, it is very important. But it is also changing its status in a way in the story and it is also, I think very importantly, uh, becoming uh, a different, a slightly different question. It's not so much the question of how the individual child is capable of acquiring language, it is more the question of how a group of children manage to acquire the same language uh, together. And uh, the view that, that, that Eva and I have developed both on language and on evolution, uh, I think allows us to uh, open new venues for thinking about this. With respect to Evo Devo, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the linguist uh, uh, in this pair. Um, uh, Eva Yablonka is the evolutionary biologist and she's been also very much responsible for some of these developments in Evo Devo and I feel uh, that it's not my place to actually define it. I think I can say something uh, both about what I think it is, uh, 
with an outsider view, uh, and also why it is so important. Um, I think that the major point there, um, which uh, Wes Eberhardt put very, very uh, eloquently in her book, uh, is that Evodevo changes our conception of what genes are about in developmental processes. They are not the thing that everything is founded on. Uh, they are followers in evolution. They are the last step in a process that begins, when we talk about behavior and cognition, uh, begins with the all-important notion of plasticity and then the capacity of animals based on their cognitive plasticity to engage in exploratory behaviors, then stabilize them, uh, then let their offspring learn them, then develop them more. Uh, then on the basis of these new uh, behaviors, um, um, allow for changes in neural development, in the way uh, the nervous system of uh, young individuals uh, develop in order to meet challenges that began as a result of this exploration and stabilization. Um, because of that, eventually, as a result of all this, you get to a point where a behavior that started as an exploration gets genetically accommodated, uh, always partially, but at a certain generation in the future following this exploratory behavior, you'll get a population of individuals uh, who are more genetically suited for this behavior. So this change of emphasis or, 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 or change of the conception of the drama which puts genes in the last place, not in the first place, uh, is for me uh, a major key uh, for the understanding of what is happening in the cultural and, devel and genetic development of human beings uh, with respect to language and with respect to other issues. In each of these issues, it seems that we first started with explorations, collective explorations, trying to find new and innovative solutions to problems that the environment has put in front of us. Uh, and it was based on plasticity, on inventiveness, on collective communication. Um, and these solutions uh, later on, to the extent that we were very successful, uh, changed us uh, cognitively, emotionally, and also finally uh, genetically. Uh, so if you think about um, uh, computer games today, I think it's very, very easy to explain the kind of idea. Um, computer games have been uh, invented uh, not on the basis of a genetic mutation of this sort or the other. They are the result of um, uh, a collective exploration by certain people who are the experts on this. Uh, once we have computer games, um, uh, a lot of cryptic variation, mute variation between individuals is all, is all of a sudden exposed and it turns out certain children are better than others in playing computer games. Uh, if you assume then a situation, which is not true for us today, but assume a situation <coughs> that was probably true very early in our evolution, uh, that uh, only children, the, more, the better you are with a computer game today, uh, you'll, the more offspring you'll get. So your capacity with a computer game gives you a selective advantage in Darwinian terms. Then you can see very easily, based on the model of Evodevo, how, I don't know, 100 or 200 generations from now, we'll have a human species that is genetically um, uh, um, uh, prepared for computer games. So the genetic capacity for computer games will be the result of the cultural invention and not the other way around. That's, for me, the major issue in Evodevo, what it contributes to us. What I would like to uh, uh, highlight um, at the moment uh, is, a, is a volume that's going to appear in Oxford University Press, I hope in 2014, um, <clears throat> it's taking a lot of time, these things, that I'm editing together with uh, Chris Knight and Jerome Lewis, 
Um, Jerome Lewis is, a, is an anthropologist working on hunter-gatherer societies. Chris Knight uh, is, a, is a veteran anthropologist who's been working a lot on the evolution of language and on the relationship between the cultural development of ritual and the evolution of language. And um, uh, we added uh, this volume, there are 25 chapters in it, uh, from people coming in from linguistics, psychology, archaeology, uh, paleontology, uh, ape research, um, evolutionary uh, biology, um, philosophy, um, and so on, uh, child language. And, um, and uh, the, the general idea behind this volume is to try to put forth the social hypothesis about the evolution of language in a concentrated and as clear as possible uh, way uh, that is um, what we all of us say together is uh, uh, look, uh, the key to the understanding of the evolution of language is not about the prior cognitive evolution of human individuals. There's a part that is about that, but that's not the issue. The issue is the maturation of pre-linguistic human societies to the point where the technology of human language could be invented and further developed, where explorations could begin with this new way of communication that could then be stabilized on the basis of all kinds of developments in, in, in alloparenting, in tool usage, in cooking, in the changing of uh, division of divisions of labor within communities, in the changes in the relationships between the sexes and so on and so forth. Um, and that to the extent that we understand the evolution of language, the origin of language, uh, um, on the basis of this social maturation, then we can start thinking about the way individuals began to be influenced by this social dynamic, including eventually genetic accommodation. So the volume is called The Social Origins of Language, uh, the Door Knight and uh, Lewis editors, uh, and I hope it's going to come out in 2013. Uh, 14. <laughs>